James chapter 3 is where we're going to be. We're looking at verses 1 through 12 this morning. If you've ever heard the statement, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. I just want to tell you that is not true. Maybe you've heard that statement from uh, a parent or a teacher to help you deal with uh, people that were talking mean to you as a child or bullies or how to manage bullies or deal with bullies. But whoever made that statement must not have been close to that many people. And whoever made that statement was definitely single or not in a serious relationship. Because words can absolutely hurt us. Most of us, if we go to counseling, we've gone to counseling, uh, and the most traumatic things that we've gone through probably haven't been things that have happened to us, uh, like in an uh, accident or falling off the sw- swing or breaking our, our arms. But as I've dealt with people over the years, most of the traumatic things that have happened to the people that I've had the privilege of serving and, and hearing and counseling have been by the words that someone has said to them, the words that have brought harm or pain uh, to them, that has been said to them or, or, or about them. And in the same note, there are the people that have seen grow in their relationship with Christ are one of the biggest instruments of growth and momentum and life-altering, life-shifting things that have happened have, because, have, have, have taken place because of the words of life that people have given them. And so words are incredibly powerful. They're incredibly powerful to God himself. That's why he created words. They are so powerful. Even God himself, even in creation, how did God create the world? Was it through his hands or was it that he thought the world into existence? No, Genesis 1 and 2 says that he spoke the word Uh, He spoke the world into existence. So words, they can create worlds, right? They can make things happen. Jesus himself in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. And you see John chapter 1 verse 18, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus himself is called the word in John. The word is makes something happen. They don't just say something, they do something. If you hear the words, you're hired, that means it did something for you. It wasn't just something that you heard, but it's something that was in action. It was going to change your income. It was to change the way that you would live your life. If you've ever heard, heard, said the words, I do, it didn't just say something, it did something. It meant that you said, I do, that I would enter into a, a covenant sacred relationship with a person as long as I shall live. That did something, correct? Pirates win. That does something, right? It changes the way that we would live our lives. Unfortunately, it doesn't even change the way we worship on Sunday, which is a problem, but it changes the way that we would live our lives. We would like to hear that more soon, right? Words matter, and they are powerful. That's why I can remember what someone said to me, good or bad, 30 plus years ago. And then then this morning, I want you to see just how powerful, the power that you hold right now because you can use words. I want you to be aware of that power. And this morning, we're not here to celebrate our power, right? We're here to celebrate God's, that he's all powerful. And we come here to worship the name of Jesus, not celebrate our power, but his power. But because Uh, because each of us have the ability to use words, be it spoken words or written words or sign language or whatever it is, there is a power that we must be aware of in how we use our words. And what did we learn from the great theologian, Spider-Man's uncle, Uncle Ben, with great power becomes great, what? Responsibility. And so we have a responsibility to use our words in such a way that would bring life. And that can only happen if our words and our hearts are under the lordship of Christ. And so that's what we're going to unpack this morning in James 3. How can we use our words 
in the very way that God has designed them to be. And so James, throughout the book of James, he is going to warn us about how we use our words. In fact, we even saw it already in James chapter 1, verse 26. He says, if anyone thinks he is religious, and this is not the bad kind of religion where you're trying to earn the favor of God through all your good works, so that's the bad kind of religion, but he's talking about the good kind of living, religion, like the kind of religion that says, I'm transformed by Jesus and I want to live my life for him out of the overflow of what he's done in our hearts. So he says, if anyone thinks he's re- religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, he says, this person's religion is worthless. No matter what you do for the kingdom, if you can't bridle your tongue, he's saying that your religion is worthless. You can come to church and you can be someone who stands in the auditorium and you can sing praises to God and you can lift your voice and lift your hands and passionately uh, engage with the Father. And then you can go to a, a community group and you can go to D group and you can faithfully give and you can faithfully serve and you can make an impact on the community. But you and I both could completely ruin our entire reputation just by the words that we speak. That's what James is saying. And James even says it later in James chapter 4 verse 11. He says, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the whole law and judges the law. But there is one lawgiver and judge, and he is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? You see this church The words that we say against our brothers and sisters in Christ can be considered good, and they also can be considered evil. And when we act evil, we're acting as a judge that we would act like it's better than the law itself. It's better than the word itself. When we speak and we proclaim what a person is and what a person is not, he's saying you are acting as a greater judge than the Bible itself. Anybody want to say that they have that power? And James is like, no, no, you don't have that power. And sometimes I think we, we look at things like gossip or we look at things like slander as lesser sins. We're saying, well, at least I'm not a murderer. At least I'm not an adulterer. At least I'm not an infidelity. And we kind of go and we make these bigger sins and we say, well, it, it, gossip and slander, like everybody does that. No, 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 James says gossip and slander, he says it's evil. And he says, there's one lawgiver and there's one judge. Guess who that is? It ain't you. Therefore, when you criticize and you judge harshly, you're trying to play, according to James, according to the word of God, you're trying to play the role of God. And so James, he hammers out this issue of how we speak um, throughout the book of James. And so James chapter 3 is perhaps his most comprehensive teaching on how we use our tongue, how we um, speak to one another. And here's kind of how it's all been kind of adding up throughout this, um, these chapters. I mean, end of chapter one and going into chapter two, uh, James has been showing us how the gospel should shape us. And if the gospel is shaping us, the gospel of Jesus Christ, we really believe in the power of Jesus and his death and, and his resurrection, that it leads to a life of loving other people. And so chapter two, we, he confronts us in how we deal with the sin of partiality, that we should not show uh, partiality or racism or discrimination. If we're changed by the gospel, we won't show those things. And then the end of chapter 2, he says, faith without works is dead. And one of the ways that we have, that we can show genuine faith is how we love others. And so now in chapter 3, James is continuing to show us how the gospel should shape us our life. Now, specifically, how we speak to and about one another. And with that, he's going to do two things in this section. One, he's going to talk about how powerful the tongue is. And then two, he's going to show us how difficult it is to control it. So this is going to be a lot of fun, all right? James chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1. Who's ready? All right, you can use your words. This is okay. This is a safe place, right? Who's ready? All right, all right. James chapter 3, verse 1. He says, not many of you... Um, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, I love this because he starts with 
teachers. He's talking about teachers and preachers of the Bible. And here's one of the great things about uh, preaching through books of the Bible. We try not to skip verses. We try to keep going uh, through the verses. And so I could have easily got up this morning and said, or this week and said, man, I can't wait to talk about uh, to challenge our people with gossip and slander. So finally, some of the people that are gossiping and slandering in the church, they can be quiet, and maybe some of them can get saved finally. You know, like we kind of go through this thing of like, I get to challenge them. But no, what does James start off with? The teachers and preachers. He goes, why? Because they'll be judged with greater strictness, meaning no one is exempt from this, especially the pastors, the elders, the teachers, the preachers of God's word. And he says the greater strictness, meaning there is a judgment that should come as a result of you proclaiming God's word. And I want everyone who wants to go to seminary and they get starry out about how awesome it's going to be one day to preach in, in front of people week by week. But it's really hard because it's gonna, there is a judgment that comes. I, hold, I have to uphold the word of God, the elders of integrity, the pastors of integrity. You have to uphold um, the word of God. And thankfully, we have an awesome church here where in terms of feedback, I get over 90% of the feedback I get is positive. It comes from a place of encouragement. But there is a judgment that comes along with it as it should be. Because here's the reality. I've worked in ministry for over 24 years now, and I can tell you that I've really worked hard to have a, a good reputation. I've failed in many ways, but in many ways, I've tried my best to, to be a healthy pastor, to be a healthy husband, a healthy, a healthy father, a healthy man of God. I go to counseling, get coaching, all the different things to, try to make sure I stay healthy. But I could completely ruin all of that, like, right now. Isn't that scary? Like, I could say something, um, I could say something heretical, I could say something inappropriate, unnecessarily offensive, where I would be asked to step down. I could say something right now that could be a short clip on YouTube and ruin our, my ministry here and honestly ruin even the integrity's reputation. To where the, one of the elders would come up next week and say, y'all remember Pastor Ben, right? We're going to pray for him right now, right? He's not here this morning, right? And I could do that, and this is why James says not many of you should be teachers, Because it's important what you say. What you say matters. Your words have power. And then James says in verse 2, he says, For we all stumble in many ways. So all of us, whatever generation you come from, we stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a what? Perfect man, able to bridle his whole life. Body And so James brings us right into the realness here, doesn't he? He says, saying you have a perfect control over your tongue is like saying you always have a constant thriving prayer life. No one says that, right? But even more so, he says, with our tongue, because James says that a person who doesn't stumble in this way, in the way that he speaks, is a perfect man. Who's a perfect man? There's only one. His name is who? Jesus. The Sunday school answer works here. 60% 60 of the time works every time, right? There's only one man who hasn't stumbled in this way, meaning all of us have said something that we shouldn't have said. I remember when I was in sixth grade, I was always really skinny growing up as a kid. Like my parents would give me those those shakes in the morning to try to add weight from like GMC and stuff. And I went to school one day, sixth grade, really skinny. And this girl walks right up to me and she goes, oh my gosh, Ben, you are so skinny you look just like Kermit the Frog. And I said, well, at least I don't look like Miss Piggy. And, okay, don't judge me, all right? (laughs) Sixth grade, all right, sixth grade. To which I also learned there's difference in how you trash talk with a boy and how you trash talk with a girl, which was also taught to me in a lecture by my female teacher for an hour after that, to which she also told me she, the girl cried and went home early that day. So I felt really, really, really bad, all right? And so we all say something that we shouldn't say. And also, God gave me a quick wit, which I learned later can be used for good. Um, and so we, have, we all say something that we wish we haven't said. I, I've had to apologize to people in this room right now, more than one person in this room right now. I can look at you right now in this room of something that I said that I wish I did not say. Not just from up front, but to you personally. 
And that could be something that could be unintended or it's something that came from an unhealthy place. But we have all done it. And maybe for some of you, you have ruined relationships or friendships because of something that you said. Maybe you've defamed a person's character or gossiped about them or made up lies about them and caused an irreconcilable distance in the relationship. And maybe this has happened in your, in your friendships or your family members or your workspaces, wherever it is. But we've all said something that's brought harm to someone else at some point in our lives. And James says, hey, I want to tell you there's grace here because there's only one person who hasn't done that. And he's the person who came and he died for our sins, including the words that we shouldn't have said, that we said, that don't honor him. And that's just how good he is. So friend, if you're sitting here this morning and you're like, yep, I've said some things or some people I'm thinking of right now, I just want to tell you, there is grace here. And that's why we need the gospel. And look at what else says James, James says about the power of our words. Look in verse 3. He says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we, got, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. And so he uses two analogies. One, he talks about a horse, and he says a horse, you put a bit in its mouth. If you're trying to steer a horse, if you're riding a horse, this small bit can control this thousand plus pound uh, creature. And if you don't know how and you're trying to ride it, that's going to go what? That's going to go bad for you, right? It's going to go all over the place. It will be out of control. And then he uses this analogy of a ship and a rudder. The rudder is a small little um, part of the ship. It's on the very back, typically, of a ship. I, I don't have a boat. Um, I, I have friends that have boats that take me out anytime, right? Um, but I got this kayak, a pedal drive kayak. A pedal drive kayak is for people like me who don't want to paddle because I'm 40 plus years old and those days are over, right? And so I have this pedal drive kayak. I can sit back and I can pedal and it has this, um, this place in the bottom where it can it moves and then I have this small little um, uh, button on the side of this little knob on the side that I can turn and I can shift and there's this rudder this little small piece of plastic in the back that can control which direction I am and one time my rudder system was broken and I just went in circles over and over again why wow, one small rudder could control the whole ship and this is what James says our words are like this our, with our whole bodies. He says in verse 5, he says, So the tongue is a small member, yet boast of great things. It's one of the smallest parts of our body, but think about how much it directs our lives. Do you know the tongue has eight muscles? Our, our tongue has eight muscles in it. And it seems that those muscles can never grow tired, is it not? Husbands, do not say amen there, right? It seems that they never go tired. We work our other muscles, and we're like, man, they're so tired. I'm just exhausted, but these seems like these muscles, they, they never go tired. And then he continues in the second part of verse 5. He says, how great a, a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire. Listen to this. The entire course of life and setting on fire by hell itself. James does not want us to miss this point. He says the tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth. It's a rudder that steers a ship and probably the most sobering analogy. He says it's like a small flame that can grow to scorch an entire forest. You think about this for a second. It's, it's relatively small, but it can change your, the course of your entire life, whereby people will form their opinions of you based on the words that come out of your mouth. People will often try to gauge your emotional health or your spiritual vitality, your maturity, your intelligence, all by your words or even not just your words that come out of your mouth, but also what you tweet and what you share on Facebook. We begin relationships with words. We end relationships with words. With words, we draw people close. With words, we push people away. 
In the 1970s, there was a well-known rivalry between two legendary boxers, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, and you might know of this uh, epic rivalry, rivalry that took place, but what you, don't, what you may not know is they used to be really close friends, and you would think that what ended their friendship was just the, the competitiveness of boxing, but what ended their friendship was when Muhammad Ali, in an effort to promote his fight against Joe Frazier, called Frazier an Uncle Tom and an ugly gorilla. And the, words, the war of wor- words got so bitter that not only did it end their friendship, but it left re- reservoirs of hatred between both of them and bitterness, particularly in Joe Frazier's soul. And biographers say that, uh, that Joe Frazier, when he went to the grave as a bitter man, bragging that he was the one who gave Muhammad Ali Parkinson's disease. And he rejoiced over Ali's sickness. So you would think the rivalry and the hatred started with fists, but no, it started with words. And it ended with words. Maybe you've experienced that before. Some of the, most, some of the worst things people told me are the very things today, as a 44-year-old man, that the enemy echoes to try to take me down. I remember in elementary school when a teacher, when I struggled with school, a teacher mocked me and called me slow. And those words still haunt me today when I'm not in a good space mentally or spiritually. Satan loves to jump in and try to echo those words to me now. And at the same time, I can remember after I became a believer in Jesus, godly men and women who discipled me, and they would tell me what they saw in me, how God had uniquely created and gifted me in ways that he would use me in my life. And now when I'm trusting God with whatever season I am in, I'm reminded of those words that God gave the people, the people of God then and throughout the years as a way to encourage me in my walk with Christ. And so today, these are the words that the Holy Spirit brings up to me to continue to help me remain faithful. That plus, obviously, the word of God. And I'm one, I'm, I totally believe that God primarily speaks through his word, and that's why I love to get up here and preach and share God's word with you. But in addition, I know one of the most significant ways that we get to see God's love demonstrated in our life is through other people. And this is often shown in how others speak to us or how we speak to others. And friends, we need to keep in mind that when we speak to one another, the power of our words and some of you might just want to say, well, I know I've done personality assessments, and, uh, and I know I'm an Enneagram 8, and so I'm not really good at being nice to people. And you say, well, I've done this strength finder, and I've done strength finder tests, and one of my lowest is empathy, so I'm just not going to be good at that. Listen, we don't get to hide behind our temperament. Tone absolutely matters. Not just the words that we say, but our tone and how we come across it matters. So if you have your natural thing, listen, it's not my natural thing to obey Jesus, but somebody gave me the Holy Spirit, amen? And he died on the cross for my sins. And so listen, we don't get to hide behind, man, I'm just not good at that. It's just not my natural tendency. No, no. God through his spirit begins to change us from the inside out and we begin to want to love others. This is, the, this is James' whole point in this passage. God's words are to bring life. Listen, God doesn't speak to us in a word of shame to motivate us. He, he doesn't use guilt um, to motivate us. Rather, what does God use? God uses, according to John chapter 1, Jesus came full of grace and truth. Jesus, God loves to speak to us through those two ways, perfectly through grace and truth. Jesus embodied perfection of grace and truth. So if we're believers and we want to know how to talk to each other, it's got to be through grace and truth. And so if you're a believer, there's no room for guilt or shame in how we communicate to each other. Like if you're a parent in this room and you're used to just saying, um, I am, to your kids, I am disappointed in you. Friend, stop saying that. Those statements are void of the gospel. You think God's disappointing in us? No, are there things that we do that are sinful, just like there are things that our kids do that do disappoint us? Of course. But because of the cross of Jesus Christ, he's not look at you with disappointment. He looks with you with approval. He looks with you with with love or the things that God wants to change. Yes, he's going to do that, but he's not disappointed in you. God doesn't use shame to motivate. So this is why we don't see to our kids. Shame on you. God doesn't speak to his kids this way. 
We can say, yeah, I'm frustrated, I'm hurt, I'm sad, I'm angry. Those, those are, but, but words of condemnation, may they never be so. When we speak to our dear friends or our loved ones, think about the way that we speak. Do our words, do they give life or do our words bring death? How do we motivate our friends? Do we motivate them through manipulation? Do we motivate them through guilt? Do we motivate them through shame? Do we motivate them through intimidation? Friends, James would call that evil. And I know here in the South, we tend to get into this like nitpicking at each other and kind of picking, sometimes it's going to be lighthearted and some of that's fine. But do we realize that just the practice of giving words of life to others can change the course of their entire life? So why are we so afraid to give words of life to others? Well, James shows us in James verse, uh, 3, verse 7. He says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being, listen to this, no human being can tame the tongue. He says it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. He says every human being has been able, or every animal has been able to be tamed. I've been different places throughout the world. I've been to Asia. I've been to Africa. I've been to Dominican Republic and other places. When I'm in Asia, I've seen people tame tigers. When I'm in Africa, I've seen people tame lions. And it happens all the time. I was at um, a convention recently with my youngest son, Gideon. Gideon's friend just bought a reptile at the, as a reptile exhibit, I guess, every year in Greenville. So I walk in, and there's all of these animals and creatures. And these people have these giant pythons around their neck, and they're just talking to them just like they're, they're human beings. And they're, they've got them tamed. I'm like, thank you. You've got that one tamed. Because I'm walking around, and Jess and I are walking around, both our arms, like the hair is standing up on our arms, because we're like, we hope that you have that one tamed. We walk over, this lady, she's got a pig as a pet. And I learned later, like this week, studying about this, um, do you know that pigs are one of the top, like most loyal pets that you could ever find, and they're smarter than most animals? Did not know that. People have pigs as pets. You can tame a pig. And pigs, uh, animals, will often um, can be tamed. I mean, just this week, uh, Cavaliers, they tried to tame a pack of wolves. It didn't work out for them, right? Finally, right? That was a joke. Okay. And James says, no human being can tame the tongue. He calls it a restless evil. When you think about your vices, my vices are like, I love food. I love Asian food. I love sushi. I love cheap Chinese food. I love Japanese food. Cheap Chinese food, here's a great hack. If, you, if they can get sesame chicken right, most of the time they can get everything else right. If they mess up sesame chicken, they're not going to get anything else right, okay? That's just the thing. But that's one of my vices. I love those. I love, man, I, could, I play chess on my, on my phone. All, I can pull it up, and I, it's just one of my ways of escape. I play speed chess and chess with other people. That's one of my things. And whatever your vice is, what, like, what do you go to? We have to go to it, right? I have to go to the Chinese restaurant. I have to go open up my app and watch a game or play a game. I have to go actively to pursue it. Your tongue is a restless evil because you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to pay anything. It is there. It is always there. And he says it is full of deadly poison. That's pretty scary, isn't it? You ever heard someone say, God doesn't give us more than we can handle? Do you know that's not in the Bible? It's not true. We do have something we can't handle. It's called our tongues, according to James chapter 3. So you can't fix it yourself. This is why we need Jesus. And James continues. He says in verse 9, he says, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. And from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. And so Jesus, James, rather, is going to get into the root of the problem here. But notice the hypocrisy that happens with our tongues. He says, with it we can sing. We can sing worship and we can bless the Lord. We just came in and we sang, uh, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, uh, God of glory, there is none like you. And he's saying with the same tongue, even in the same moment sometimes, we can look at another image bearer of God and say, look at that moron. James says this thing ought not be so. I mean, think about it. These, we are God's children. We are God's brothers and sisters. We are uh, co-image um, bearers of God. And God's like, why are you talking bad about my other kids? How would you feel if someone blessed you 
and then cursed your kids. I mean, you curse my kids, we ain't friends, all right? I, I'm pretty nice to people in the service industry. A, a few years back, this lady um, that worked in a, in a place was really mean to Finn. And I rarely, like, call somebody, but I, like, called her. I was like, why are you being mean to my son, all right? You're not really nice. That was really mean, you know? Finn's super sweet. Why are you being mean to my son? Because we don't want to be around somebody that curses our kids. We wouldn't. We would choose who? People that, who do we love the most? We typically love the most people that love our kids, that bring life, the coaches, the teachers, the youth pastors, whoever it is. We say, these are the people I really love because they love my kids. So how does it land on the Lord? Do you think that when, it, when you come in, you sing and you bless his name and then curse the ones that he sent his son to shed his blood for? How do you think that lands with the Lord? And do you realize the way that we speak to and about your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ is equally as important as the words that you come and sing to Jesus on Sunday morning? Do your words praise the Lord, not just with what you say in song, but what to and about your brothers and sisters in Christ? Ephesians 4 says in verse 29, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only as such as for the building up as it fits occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And then he says this, which is interesting. He says in verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do you realize that when we speak ill of each other, it grieves the Holy Spirit? And a lot of people have made this passage about cussing or four-letter words, but I can tell you it's so much more than that. It's not so much about the words, meaning you can say no cuss words, but you could still be really hurtful. I heard that Adolf Hitler didn't use cuss words because he thought they were morally wrong. Isn't that fascinating? It's been said that over that 125 people died for each word of Hitler's manifesto, Mein Kampf. He was extremely violent with his words, but he wasn't a cusser. Fascinating. What's worse, gossip or a four-letter word? Just saying a word is not what makes it sinful. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. However, when we use words to tear down a person, that's what Scripture challenges us against. That's what grieves the Holy Spirit. That's what sin is. That's when we bring harm to someone else. And many Christians, they sit back and say, well, I don't struggle with um, corrupt talk. I don't cuss. That's not the measure of giving grace to our hearers that you don't cuss. And I'm not up here saying, go say whatever you want, because there has to be wisdom in how we speak. But don't sit there and say, well, I smiled at the person and I didn't cuss. I even said, bless their heart. And I got to tell you, if you are not from the South and you hear someone say, bless your heart, you just got cussed out, all right? And we can say things that sound really great and still have the intent of tearing that person down. And as I say this, listen, there is grace here. No one is exempt from this. We all fail in this area. And so what I don't want is for us to hear this and go, well, I've got to go get my life right by how I talk to people. No, that's not how this works. Remember, the tongue is something that none of us can tame. The tongue isn't actually the problem. The tongue is the indicator of the problem. The tongue is the temperature, but it's not the thermostat. The the thermostat is our hearts. If we want to change the temperature, we have to change the thermostat, right? So when you're cursing other people with your words, When you're showing up in relationships with gossip or slander or defaming a person's character or lying or being passive aggressive or bullying with words or shutting people down or one-upping others or one-downing others and all the more, that's an indicator that your heart isn't aligned with the Lord's heart. This means that if you show up that way consistently, this means that you have some stuff that you are allowing to build up in your heart that you haven't looked at or faced. This could be your own sadness or disappointments or grief or anger that you've allowed to build up. And instead of stopping and paying attention to it, you allow it to fester and it comes out sideways. And by coming out sideways, you use it now to tear others down. Because that's so much easier, isn't it, than looking at our own hearts. And this is why some of the most critical people of others are actually more critical of themselves, even though they might not appear that way on the outside. But it's always true. It's always an issue of the heart. 
Maybe it's even a sin that you're not, a, a, not bringing before the Lord into other people. So instead of repenting, you have to bring others down to build yourself up. Whatever it is when we are in the habits of tearing others down with our words and we're not quick to repent and want to change, that's an indicator of something deeper that's going on in our hearts. And I'm going to say something that's pretty hard. But our words, our words are one of the highest indicators of the health of our hearts. Our words are one of the highest indicators of the health of our hearts. And so James says this, he says in verse 11, does not a spring forth, pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? The answer is no. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olive trees or grape uh, vine produce figs? The answer is no. And he says, neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is exactly the analogy I used last week when we talked faith without works, that we cannot within and of ourselves produce good works. It's just like me. I used this analogy last week. If, you, if I take an orange and I go outside to one of those big tall pine trees, which thankfully didn't get blown down this week, but I t- walk up to the big pine tree and I nail an orange to it and I look at you and say, look, we have orange trees now, you would say, no, we don't. Why? Because how do we know if we have an orange tree? It produces oranges. And so the same way, if we're believers in Christ, and if our hearts are being changed, and what's happening and what we're producing in our life, if we're producing good fruit, according to James, we are, it's going to come out of our mouths. We won't be able to help ourselves. The goodness of God and the life-giving words that we could say to others, it will come out of our now- mouths because that is what God is doing in our hearts. And so Jesus has dealt with this here in, in Matthew chapter 12. Jesus is Matthew 12. He's, his disciples bring... Um, Fourth, a man who was healed, he had a withered hand. The Pharisees, the religious people of the day, they look down on this man. They begin to condemn this man with their words. And I love what Jesus says here in response in Matthew 12, verse um, 33. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for, for the tree is known by its what? Fruits. You brood of vipers. That's not a compliment. Jesus can say it. We can't say it. <laughs> you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person um, out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of the evil uh, treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, listen to this. People will give account for every careless word they speak. Parentheses, tweet, post on Facebook, DM, text, email. We will give account. And he says, for by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. What does that mean? The words are the indication of our hearts. All of it is an indication of our heart. This is why Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, the reason why you can't speak to this man kindly and graciously is because of the issue that is happening in your heart. And so this morning, my question is, based on the words that you say, like this week, how is your heart doing this morning? The words that if you were doing an inventory of who you spoke to this week, the people that you encountered in your workplace, in your family, in your community group, at school, or in a classroom, or wherever it is that you've gone, what does that say about the condition of your heart? I'm not just saying the things that you said to the person, like to their face, but what about the things that you said about them when they walked away? You say the things that give life to them. How about the tone of your voice? Was the tone of your voice one that would give life to them in the way that you spoke to them? Was it kind and gracious and merciful? Did it show that you want deeper connection or did it push them away? And like I said, sometimes we can get into temperaments and we can go into personality types and we go, well, I've got I've to be who I am. No, no, the goal is to be like Jesus. So is your tone one, is your words, the content of your words, when someone's in front of you or away from you, or the tone of your words, is it one of gracious and kindness? Does it show truth and grace as Jesus showed truth and grace? And so as I say that this morning, it's not just to get better at talking. That's not what this message is about. Instead, when our words are out of control, 
when they are like the bit in the horse's mouth that is out of control or the rudder that is broken or the, or the fire or the flame that continues to grow and scorch an entire um, forest, when that is happening, I invite you into curiosity of your own heart. If your words are showing up where you're cursing others instead of blessing others, be curious about your heart. And ask the Lord, God, am I really submitting my life to you? Because if that's the case, if these are ways that's showing up and it's not led with uh, repentance, if it's not led with a desire for reconciliation, my challenge is that probably something is going on in your heart that you're not submitting to the Lord. And I want to remind you this morning that Jesus didn't die to clean up your mouth. He died to clean up our hearts. And when when we know the gospel and we believe in the gospel and believe in the finished work of Christ, When our hearts then are changed, the the Bible tells us that he fills us with his Holy Spirit. And then we get to live from a place of a new heart. And from that new heart, we're able to produce good works. And part of those good works are the words that we say. And so this morning, my challenge is for you is to ask the Spirit of God, Lord, show me. Show me the words that I've spoken this week. Show me the words I'm speaking right now. Are my words bringing life or are they bringing death? And then if that's the case, if they're bringing death, if, they're using, if, I, if I'm using my words to curse others, not bless others, Lord, show me in my heart where I've not surrendered to you. Show me in my heart that needs healing, that needs redemption. And there's grace here, friends. There's only one, there's only one who's never used his words in a way that would curse us. And his name is Jesus. And he came and died that we can have life and have it abundantly. And we can come from a place of producing good fruit because of what he's done in our hearts. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask now that you would help us and guide us through this time of response. God, search us and try us. Show us our need for you, Father. And my hope is, even this morning as we share this, oftentimes our tendency might be to want to go to shame and go, oh, this is, this is another reason why I'm just a terrible person. I just haven't spoken well today. I haven't spoken well this week. I think about all these things. And we go to go to guilt. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. And who am I? Why am I, why am I such a bad person? We can, we can go into those words. And Lord, those are not the words that you use. You, you don't use shame to motivate us. You don't use guilt to motivate us. Lord, your spirit is one of kindness. The apostle Paul tells us that, Lord, you... Your your kindness is what leads to repentance. And so, God, I pray for those of us in the room, maybe you feel this conviction in our hearts. May we not go to shame. May we not go to guilt. But may we go to grace. And may your grace, Lord, just wash over us this morning. May your grace convict our hearts, Lord, to surrender our lives to you this morning. I pray for those in this room maybe who never trusted you, Maybe they hear the kindness and the grace and the words that you've spoke over us this morning. And may your word draw them into saving faith. And may they believe in you. And Lord, for those of us who believe in you, God, I pray that we would live in light of the Holy Spirit. And that, Lord, you would show us the indicators of our hearts by the words that we speak. But may we then take that and just surrender to you. And may you, because of our surrender to you and our repentance before you, may you produce good fruit. And Lord, may that good fruit be an honesty that we could say, yep, I messed up this week. I've sinned against my brother or sister. I've just sinned against my coworker, my friend, my roommate, my spouse, my kids. May that, may that place not just lead us to hiding and just saying I shouldn't have done that, but may it lead to a step of repentance, a repentance before you, and maybe even an apology to someone else to say I shouldn't have said, I'm sorry I've said this to you. I'm sorry I said this about you. May you just work, do your work through your spirit. You would draw us closer to you, draw us closer to each other. God, help us to rest in that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I'm going to respond. I'm going to invite you to respond to singing. We're going to sing two more songs. And as we're singing together, my hope is that the spirit would just do his work in your heart. And as he does this work in our heart, we can come to the table. There's two tables in the back. There's two tables up front. And we can remind ourselves of his sacrifice for us. The sinless Savior came and died and rose from the grave. And we can come to the table and we'll take the bread, and the bread is a remembrance of the body of Christ that was broken for you on the cross. You take the bread, you'll dip it into the cup, and the cup is a reminder of his shed blood for us. And this table means this. There's grace here, friend. There's grace here in the gospel. 
May we run to grace this morning, not run to shame, not run to guilt, but may we run to grace. Amen? May we stand together as we respond to the good news.